slides for all these presentations are on the website. And I think Gail's up to date with them right now. So you can find them again. Um, again, this was a, the first series. And we're hoping we can do more of these engineer, engineering seminars with after ideas. I got one uh, cooking right now. Probably won't happen until the fall about superconducting magnets. We've got a couple guys. Tori Salviego, who's going to do something along with the cooker, so probably three or four seminars there. But we're looking for a couple that we could do uh, during the summertime, so suggestions, I'll take them. There's my email address, and there's Gail's, we'll probably put it on the website as well. So let us know if you have ideas, particularly if you would be willing to give this seminar. <laughs> we'll help you out with all the logistics and stuff. So. Anyway, so today we have Dana Ranius talking about the uh, plans for the 12 jet cryogenic system. So we'll go on that. Um, a couple other bookkeeping things. We've got the, the standard survey to fill out at the end. Thanks for doing that. The others, please stay here for a short time. We've got a few things at the end we want to do, so please don't get up and leave. Fill out your, your survey form and stay. Uh, can you make up a class um, and get the uh, credit if you look at the... Um, That's a good question. Um, is there anybody who's in that situation where you need to make up a class to get to the, the CEUs? <coughs> Two, three. Okay, we'll have to find out about that. i got to kind of look at the rules for the governing board. If you do things remotely, there are different rules than if you do it in person. And so i got to go back and read that. I'll probably do something. Um, bug me if you don't hear something back soon. We'll have to research it. I'm not in that position. Right? Yeah, well, I see about three people that stuck their hands up. So, uh, we'll From the original one, if you were allowed to miss a certain number. Two? You were allowed to miss two to get the, I think it was eight CEUs. Is that right? Yeah. And we chose that, the eight CEUs. We actually had more contact hours than necessary for the eight CEUs, so we chose that. Two reasons. One, you can miss two classes. Yeah, right. The other was it's half of your two-year requirement. It's exactly half of it. So that was the convenience. But, um, I'll find out if you, if you missed three classes if you can make it up by taking a by uh, watching the video. So I'll have to find out. Okay. Maybe I, yes. Yeah, I think if you missed the two, the first, the last class was okay, but not between. I, I don't think we designated which ones you should miss. I did say that you ought to come to the ones in the middle. They tended to be a series. Um, but I think we just said you can miss two. I didn't say which ones didn't matter. So it was, it's, it's dependent on the number of contact hours you have. That's what the board works for. So I'll have to find out if you can substitute the, the video for the contact hour. Okay, good. Let's go ahead. Thanks, David. Well, first I should explain a little bit about what my role is. And uh, you've seen uh, this uh, cartoon uh, in a number of different presentations. Uh, but I'm the guy here at the trunk. And uh, basically I wear uh, two hats. Uh, one is that I'm a, uh, a system associate uh, project manager in charge of cryogenics, working with uh, the accelerator uh, to provide the cryogens for the 12 gen upgrade. And uh, the people that I track is actually my own group, the cryogenic systems group, that actually performs the work. So you see me constantly turning my hat around uh, as I take on those two different roles. So uh, when we talk about you know, uh, my job in here, uh, is basically is to provide a, uh, a system which is functional at, at lowest cost. But I have, of course, operations and people who want to optimize the coal box and compressors and like that, which are all contributing uh, to uh, my work. When we look at uh, Jefferson Lab today in our six jet, uh, we have uh, two Linux, two superconducting Linux, which have file modules in them. Uh, right now, in the North Linux, we have uh, 20 file modules. Superconducting. We also have warm bending magnets here at each of the arcs, and another 20 uh, here. 
uh, we have also three experimental halls. But the uh, purpose of here is it allows for liberty of being of you know, very unique properties to three experimental halls simultaneously. So we can actually run three beams at one time, accelerate it in the accelerator, and then take them off to uh, each of the halls. A closer look at this shows that our central heel liquefier, which cools those pile modules, both in the north and south Minac, is centrally located right in the middle of the property. These are the war marks. Those are the bending magnets that basically, after it's accelerated, they hold the beam and actually turn it around and gets accelerated began. Same goes with this arc here. There is a one section which is not part of the ring per se, but what we refer to as an injector, and what that does is take electrons and it injects them into the ring for acceleration. And uh, this beam can go up to five times around before it's shot into any one or more of the halls. Here is a picture of a cryomodule. It's about 35 feet long, about a yard in diameter. And our current cryomodules hold about 1,600 liters, or roughly around 400 gallons of liquid helium um, at uh, 2 Kelvin. On the upgrade, uh, although these are equivalent size to the new modules we're adding, they hold a lot less liquid, only about 250 liters of uh, liquid. So there's a big change in the amount of liquid helium in each one of the modules. Here shows our current configuration. Here's our accelerator ring, our two superconducting um, uh, lid axles. Here's our injector that has a two and a quarter pi modules from that location. And uh, what we have is uh, two 0.6 uh, GeV uh, lid axles. And with the upgrade, uh, we have existing locations which will add additional five pi modules to the north lid axle and additional five prior modules to the south unit. As it turns out that each one of these prior modules with the advancement of technology in these prior modules has four times the power that they had uh, with the previous modules. So if you take five and multiply by four, you get 20. So basically, we're doubling the power of going from six jet to 12 jet energy. However, this required us to add another central helium liquefier to provide that refrigeration for these modules. In addition to this, we are adding a Hall D to here, which requires a much smaller helium refrigerator. But once we add this five onto here, we end up with actually, instead of 0.6 GV max, we end up with the two 1.1 What that means is if we go around five times, we end up with the capability of providing 11 GV to, to the halls, existing halls. If we add a warm, another turn of the warm magnets, then we can bring that beam around after the fist path, bring it to the north Linac, and we end up with 12 jet here at the end of the north Linac. If we add then the transfer line, the beam transfer line to Hall D, then we can provide 12 jet into Hall D. So what are our loads? We take a look at the accelerator cell. Each of the 10 cryo modules uh, has a load up to 300 watts at 2.1 K. Now in addition to that, uh, since these vessels have this uh, liquid helium in it at 2.1, we have to shield that liquid container um, with a uh, copper barrier that is cooled to 35K. The purpose of that, even though this uh, liquid helium is sitting in a vacuum, is to keep radiation from the heat from loading up or causing an excessive heat onto the internal vessel. So we have referred to this as a shield level, and uh, that is also up to 300 watts at 35 Kelvin. So our requirements here is actually at two different temperature levels, both the sub-atmosphere 2.1K and then at the 35K shield. When you add this all up, you can see this is quite, uh, quite a low, 300 times 10, you get about 3,000 watts. Hall D is a much smaller. Um, the refrigerator 
is uh, to provide 100 watts at four and a half K, not sub atmospheric, uh, plus also a liquid that's used to cool the power leads coming into um, the uh, test apparatus. And so the combination of both refrigeration and liquefaction for the refrigerator evolved in. So what is our design goals in order to meet these two requirements? Well, first, the system must meet the accelerator refrigeration requirements. We've, we've got to cover up to 300 watts at 2.1K. We've got to cover up to 100 watts at full D. Um, we typically run our refrigerators um, from four to five years continuously around the clock. Jefferson Lab is one of the few places uh, the other place being SNS, where we were involved in the design of the system, where it is mostly unattended operation. And by unattended, we mean that uh, during Monday through Friday, we like to think we're here from 8 to 5, that at nighttime, we put one person on call for nighttime, and on the weekends, we have some special crews that come in on Saturdays and Sundays and holidays to cover uh, deliveries like a liquid nitrogen, which we use for pre-cooling uh, the system. But that's totally different from other laboratories, where the machine, you always have an operator, and there's always manual intervention, and we have automated all that. And so with this new machine, we want it to be like our other six refrigerators that we have on site, and be totally automated as much as we can. We also, from a project standpoint, want this to be minimal capital cost and operating costs as well. Cost of electricity, cost of helium gas for makeup, is going right through the roof. Our stages of the project, uh, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, is based on what they refer to as critical decision points. Uh, what we refer to as critical decision zero, it depicts that need for the project from the Department of Energy. And so this sets off a number of tasks. Some of those is in order to develop this technology, you need global research and development. Also, the Department of Energy also wants to know really a rough number about what this is really going to cost at the end. So that's this phase here. After that is happening, and if the need for the project continues, then what we enter is CD1. CD1 is the first engineering that's done. And as you develop that engineering, you have a better understanding about what the cost is going to be associated with that project. Many times at the tail end of CD1, then you're fixing that budget and schedule at the uh, end of that first half of the engineering. If this is then uh, proved to move forward, you, end your, you take your project engineering design and you go into the second phase of it, of finishing the design. And then after you finish that design, you're OK to go into construction and procurements followed by CD4, which is actually the project commissioning and deliverable. It's what you promised the Department of Energy this thing is going to do. The thing with, uh, with cryogenics is, is that in order to develop some of these uh, budgets up here and here and fix your cost, we have to know what the machine is. The unfortunate part of it is the machine, for the most part, is a purchased item. And this is a sort of a one-of-a-kind machine. So you really don't have really the cost yet. You also don't know what the size of the equipment is. And yet you have to establish all your civil requirements so they can get into the budget. That's four space building, utilities like electric power, electric nitrogen. And so a lot of the stuff that goes into this fixed budget is really a best engineering guesstimate followed by an estimate, a budgetary estimate, from the vendor. If you take a look at the cost of cryogenics, <laughs> this is the breakdown. You can see that the coal boxes and the compressors are the largest uh, portion of the, of the pie. And then you have all these other supportive systems around it. Now, for us, this is about $22 million. But I want to caution folks here because <laughs> With uh, CHL1, Central Human Liquid Fire Control, we had a lot of infrastructure. And that infrastructure allowed us to utilize buildings and electric power and other subsystems that support this without having to build new ones. 
So if you're looking at this size refrigerator for uh, from ground zero, it would be about two and a half to three times as expensive. We take a look at this engineering and design documentation. The accelerator provision gives us a uh, well, uh, sort of like a requirements document, which says, uh, look, we can accelerate this thing, we've got a solution for it, uh, and here's what we need. And that goes out to a number of different uh, departments, in which cryogenics is one of them. With that, we develop a requirements document in order to provide that type of refrigeration. We need this type of equipment, we need this type of facilities, and so forth. And that gets rolled into what we call an interface control document, which goes out to these other groups, saying, uh, you know, for civil, we need a building, we need such and such power, we need water. It goes out to our RF uh, folks and also our people who are developing the car watches. So there's integration documentation, which sets the requirements not only for what you're providing, but the interdepartment uh, control and, and goals. Let's take a look at the central field liquefier first. As I mentioned, we've got two, uh, two Linux, the North and South Linux, and we're adding uh, this 12-gel uh, new refrigerator onto it. Now, underground, we've got both the supply lines and return lines going to each of the 20 cry modules. And it's configured right now that we have connections which allows us to independently connect the North Linac as a separate Linac to the CHL1 as well as the South Linac to the CHL1. So what do we do when we're adding this additional refrigerator? Uh, what we do is basically put one on one Linac and put the other one on the other Linac. And we can do that by simply changing these jumper pipes that we have for those transformers. Here's how the system works. We've got warm helium compressors, we've got a referred to as a co-box that basically takes the compressed stored energy of the, uh, of the gas and then converts it into refrigeration. And this box only takes it down to 4.5K. That 4.5K comes down and interchanges in this little cartoon here. Here's the flow coming out of the 4.5K box and it's supplied at 3, uh, three bar before we go into a JT valve and as it goes through the JT valve, most of that very cold gas is turned into a liquid. That liquid surrounds the superconducting cavity. It fully immerses it. And what we do is we draw a vacuum over this using cold compressors, this line here, coming up through five chains, five stages of cold compressors. And this goes up to about 245 grams per second kind of flow rate. Now, uh, why, why this temperature, why this pressure? It's an inverse pressure cooker. You know how you can cook food faster? If you have a pressure cooker, you raise the pressure, it cooks faster. This is the opposite of it. We actually take it down in, in pressure so that we get colder, not hotter. And so at this pressure, right, we get this liquid very cold and it goes uh, below lambda, which is lambda. What happens then, it has no boiling. It becomes a, a, a sort of uh, uh, a, uh, a superconductor of itself. It, it doesn't, uh, the heat coming out of the modules dissipates quickly right through the liquid, so you don't have any boiling whatsoever. And that's what we don't want to have. So that's why we're, we're sub atmospheric here. So the configurations uh, here is that we currently supplies both the injector and the north and south wind axis. And we also have a, another facility at the L which takes the flow off as well off of the, off the uh, refrigerator. And we also have the capability of doing 10 grams a second uh, to our end station facility. The new one is that on CHL1, it's going to supply the injector and the wind act and our end station refrigerator for peak loading. And uh, the new refrigerator will cover the south end and the existing FDL. Now, in the case that we lose one of these refrigerators, we can take those jumpers at the central field liquefier location, and we can reconfigure it so one refrigerator can provide six gem operations for an alternative program should we lose one refrigerator completely. So, 
This is the uh, outline of both the uh, current versus the new. And here's our loads both at uh, 2.1K and also at the 35K. Uh, here's the capacity of the refrigerator. The new one, basically CHL1 and CHL2, uh, combined will have these capacities. Now we did up the liquefaction rate here because we want a little bit more than we had on the, uh, on the first machine. Here you see in your, uh, in your outline uh, what the 6 jet and 12 jet, and if you take this column here, the 42 and a quarter prime modules, you look up above, you can see where all these loads are. And it turns out that under 6 jet with uh, our CHL1, we're about 92% loaded at 4,600 watts and about 97 with our shield. Under the new both North and, and South Lynette, these are all subdivided, and you can see that uh, you know, we're not as, as loaded um, <clears throat> with the addition of the new machine, but this also doesn't include the FDL loads uh, in this graph. So CHL considerations here is, uh, you have to remember that CHL is a sort of a one of a kind. Uh, they started engineer, engineering our first machine in 1988. And uh, one company built it. They no longer um, uh, manufacture uh, this, uh, this type of refrigerator. And so this is sort of like brand new for uh, making it. It's also twice as large as any other single refrigerator in the world at 2 Kelvin. There are other locations which have the equivalent of half the size, but they have like up to eight half size refrigerators uh, with different loads on them. And when you sum them all up, they're a larger two calibre system, but they're using half size refrigerators to do that. So uh, this uh, construction problem, as I mentioned before, has, has a little bit of a problem in that you've got something that's not designed yet. And yet you've got to answer a lot of questions on civil engineering for cost estimation and design as being the predominant uh, concern. And it goes in, it covers a lot of topics that you see here uh, on, the, on the bottom that have to be answered to make allowance for when the real machine is designed by the vendor during the construction phase, or C3, that everything comes together. So, uh, some of the things we ran into with the project is uh, very large fluctuations of, uh, of the exchange rate. Uh, these large human refrigerators are basically a foreign supply. And uh, during the uh, construction phase, we have such uh, exchange variations of 1.29 to 1.65. So if you've got a budget, then uh, you know, this is a, a big concern uh, of this variation in exchange rate with the dollar. Uh, we also had a very large increase in raw materials used in the construction. A lot of this had to do with carbon, carbon steel, and stainless steel, if you've ever been tracking this recently. So, uh, as I mentioned before, CHL1 or CHL2 uh, can be used to support the six jet operation in Chicago refrigerators. Uh, this is a very nice picture. You see this in the, in the lobby. This is CHL1. And uh, in planning for this, uh, this is about 40 feet tall. And normally it would have a vacuum uh, shell that would cover both ends. But if you can imagine, you're trying to lift this 40 foot uh, device through a roof hatch to get it into the building. And uh, you're going up three and a half stories, and you've got another 40 feet the hook pipe. And, you, and because of this weight and what we refer to as crane pick over a distance and weight, you basically have to take the shells off, you have to put the shells first into the building, then you have to lower this all in, you have to have a roof hatch, you have to have a pit, this is going to fit into it. It's a lot of cost. And so when we considered this and we looked at also the, the cost savings, we decided that we just take this big portion of the tank and we move it out of doors. And we'll show you to you in a second. Here's a picture of the existing equipment that shows the 40.5K box, which is made just like a T. This is the vertical section that was going through the roof. As much as you see going above the ground, it also goes down into a pit. And then there's a horizontal 
normal section here, and then in the field, these were two were married together, all the interconnecting pipe and like that. It was very difficult to actually get control of the manufacturing techniques you need to in order to make this leak tight. Uh, this is a coal box which has the uh, coal compressors, the five stages in it. What you see here is a modified coal box, which our group did, and in modifying it, um, we got 10% more capacity out of the same coal compressors. Uh, the original manufacturer had actually square piping in this rather than round piping, interconnecting the stages. Um, they also had uh, forced flow liquid nitrogen to cool the dry motors, which are also cryogenic. We changed that all to thermal siphon design. We went to round piping with more volume to decouple each of the stages. So if one speed of one was moving, it didn't reflect into the next stage. And uh, that round piping that we put in, we, we designed uh, 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 flow diverters, which equalized the flow into the inlet of the coal compressors. Here you see the existing compressors, the warm compressors, and here's the person standing so you get an idea about what they are. We've got three 600 horsepower and three 2250 horsepower. Um, when we're operating, this doesn't include all the systems, but just the compressors alone at 6 GeV uh, take 5.2 megawatts of electric power to operate. Now, in our system, we also have, in 1999, we built and designed a second coal compressor, coal box. And this is the one that will be used with the new system. So this is taking advantage of our internal machinery and infrastructure to keep the cost of the 12 jet program as it relates to cryogenics as low as we possibly can. Here it just shows the internals of what that box uh, looks like. We were also very fortunate in the original project because where these five prime modules in each LINAC is going, we had, uh, during the CBAP uh, days, actually had put in the pipe stubs that we need for each of those 10 locations. Now, things that we're missing are some top assemblies and some uh, connection points on other process lines, and we have to do that with the 12 job. But basically, uh, these locations already existed, and uh, we just have to finish more or less the, the, uh, the assembly of each one of these bayonets that connect the new modules into the system. So there's nothing that we have to do with the distribution piping whatsoever. It was designed for twice the flow. So other uh, operational modes, well, uh, a lot of specifications come out for what we refer to as steady state. And by steady state, we mean, uh, look, uh, we've got a 3,000, 4,600 watt, 2.1 K refrigerator, and that's what we need. As actually, we're in the other pad, which is our operations, we know there's much more to it than that. And there are other modes of operation that we have to make sure that we cover such as we're not in a refrigeration mode, we're filling prime modules with liquid. So you have to be concerned if you're filling all those prime modules, what is the plant capacity for just liquefaction? Uh, also, if we're just maintaining the prime modules, not at 2.1 K, so that's spirit, but can we support 4.5 K operations designed for that? Another is when you go between these two, 2.1 and 4.5 K, um, you know, with this very low refrigeration requirement, what is the turndown of the refrigerator as well? It's a lot less load at 4.5K than it is at 2.1. So these other modes had to be mapped out in our planning to make sure that the refrigerator can cover them. And this is rather unusual for other refrigeration systems. So this becomes part of the procurement specification. And these are the six different modes that we have, both liquefaction, 4.5K, and also what is liquefaction under 2K, and also if we just have no load, no beam, no nothing at all, you know, what can we do just as a 4.5K refrigerator? And so all these modes were rolled into our purchase specification to be satisfied. When you look at that, what you find is that the efficiency of no matter what mode you have to be operating is fairly constant. And so we looked at that as well in, in the design of the system and the specification. So comparing the two 
systems of, uh, of interest here is CHL1, with everything running, all the subsystems, it's about six megawatts worth of power, electric power. CHL2, with now the improved technologies that are developed through the lab, it's going to be about four megawatts. So we're down substantially. Also, uh, liquid nitrogen, which we use to pre-cool the helium from room temperature 300 Kelvin uh, down to 80 Kelvin. The old system, one way of cooling it through about 300 gallons per hour. Uh, technology developed here, we've got this down to 200 gallons per hour. Our number of compressors, instead of being six, we only require five, so it takes a much smaller footprint. Cooling water is all this electric power that you're putting in goes into the cooling water. And so what you find here is as this number comes down, the cooling water requirement is the same thing. It goes down as well. So there's a lot to be said about our new design as far as moving in the right direction, trying to make a more efficient dog rate uh, for our experimenters and accelerator division. So as I mentioned, we've got many supportive subsystems that, that's needed by CHL2, which reduce system costs substantially. And here's just a list of that. They run from everything from buildings and outdoor foundations to our cold compressors, to our gas purification contamination monitors, everything. And uh, so all this stuff we didn't have to pay for it, it only needed to be integrated into the system. Our new equipment covers just a few items, of course in the four and a half day coal box, which now we split in two. We have a nice building, but we couldn't fit both the upper coal box and the lower coal box into it. We knew that the upper coal box, which cools the helium gas from 360K um, is basically like a tank. So why do you build a building in a pit and a roof hatch and all that for a tank? Let's put it outside. That's what we decided to do. And the, the lower coal box, this is where all our turbines and, our, and most of all our valves are. Things that you want to be protected from the environment. So let's put that on the inside of the building. You're going to see that in a few minutes with some pictures. We need an oil removal system because our compressors are basically flooded with oil to serve both as a sealing mechanism between the uh, lobes that compress the helium gas. And so once we flood that and we use that, we have to remove all the oil down to like part per billion. And so we have an oil removal system. We need, of course, a control system for the entire system and we need a human door. And uh, this just lists the facilities, the major facilities, we need electric power, water that we needed a compressor building. Here's a picture of uh, our CHL1. It's uh, three very large sections of it. Here's the where our more compressors are. This is where our 4.5K coal box and our first uh, coal compressors coal box is located here. And our this building only housed uh, the second coal compressor coal box. So there was some room in here. So what we decided to do was just utilize this uh, existing building for the internal coal box, that is the 60 to 4 Calvin coal box, and to utilize that space that we had in there, but to build a new building, but just for the warm compressors. So uh, we uh, started building this building, and here shows some construction. Now, at the time this starts, you are very much early into uh, the design of the refrigeration system. A lot of things you don't know. Yet the construction of the building during this construction phase of the project has already started. Well, what this gets into is that you make allowances for certain things to make the installation as clean as possible and least costly. One of those is that electrical conduits that feed from the motor control center to each of the compressor skids. Um, we're just, the layout of the conduit and where they stub up through the floor for each one of the skids was designed even before we placed the order for the compressors. And that's because you control which tolerances, both in width and length, that the skids could grow without affecting about where these locations are. Here's a picture. Here's our five uh, warm healing uh, compressors. This is a cartoon, a 3D model of it. Uh, this is showing the 4.5K cobox. 
Uh, the biggest portion of it here is the one that would be outdoors. The wall would be somewhere right here to the building. This would be inside of our existing building. And as I mentioned before, both of these are about 73% uh, of, uh, of the total cost for the hygienic work. Um, a little bit about the compressors. It's a sort of an orphan in design. By that I mean refrigerator manufacturers focus on 40 half cable box. They're in the, they're in the business of selling uh, basically the turbines. So they package that into 40 half cable box. When you ask them for a system, they go out to a sub uh, vendor and say, give us a compressor that can compress helium. Yet some of the efficiencies of, of how much power or how much cooling water or the efficiency of removing the oil right, may not be optimal because for the compressors, it's a borrowed technology. The compressors are basically used for other things, such as compressing air. And putting helium, it's a very small market, very specialized market. So we have to put in the research and development money into developing exactly what you need. What we did here at Jefferson Lab is we've taken everything that we learned, right, from these existing commercial designs and redesigned some very critical portions of it. And uh, this, these changes have led to a lower uh, cost goal for the cost of this, which we're interested in doing. But it also made it much more uh, better as far as maintainability and actual reliability. This is a cartoon just showing the compressors. Here's the helium being sucked into the compressor. We've got oil being injected into the, into the lobes of the screws of the compressor to both seal and cool the compressed gas. It comes out and it goes through what we refer to as a bulk oil separator. Now, this thing that looks like an inverted uh, lawn sprinkler uh, has about an efficiency which is about three times better than existing designs from industry. And uh, we use this both for a project that uh, we were consulting with for NASA down in the uh, Johnson Space Center, plus also we use that technology here for our 12-step upgrade. And here we go into an after cooler. What this does is that all this compressed gas, the oil is separated out, and then that oil goes back, gets cooled, and it gets repumped, and it goes back into the sealed compressor. This after cooler is really just a gas cooler, which basically takes the heat of the compressed gas and cools it before it enters into the, uh, into the uh, coal box or the, the additional oil removal system. Here's a picture of actual construction of one of the compressors underway. It shows the uh, drive motor and also the compressor. And now they're starting to uh, complete the, uh, the piping uh, for the oil. Uh, this is the out, uh, outside picture of the bulk oil separator. And here you can see the, uh, the manifolds that basically uh, has an inverted sprinkler that sprays the oil down uh, and actually has a number of turns where the molecules of oil and gas go centrifugally in different directions. Inside it looks just like this. This is where you can see our, by using the word, lawn sprinkler type of uh, design for this. Um, when each one of those compressors are, are put in place, they're going to be arranged in the compressor building like this. Now we've got a big trench that takes all the piping for both cooling water and for helium. And all those lines are in a trench. And these are covered over, of course, with grading. And uh, here's our medium pressure compressor, our first three stage, our first stage compressors, and then our high pressure single stage here showing all five compressors. Uh, over here, this is the 4.5A uh, coal box, the, the lower one, 16 to uh, the four tower, and outside out here is the, is the vertical outdoor one. Here's a picture actually of under, under construction of the piping going in. Uh, Compressors haven't arrived, but here are the blue lines, here are the water, and these are our helium lines that will be stubbed up and go into each one of the, of the compressors. This is a very common application you find in the gas and oil economy uh, type of work where they have this pipe and trench. Here shows a gas management. We, we bypass gas uh, uh, from high to low, each one of the stages, and so we have control valves and so forth. Now there is a final stage of where we will act when the gas is compressed.
press, this is on the outside. The building we're looking at before is off here to the left, but that piping comes out and goes through uh, three stages of uh, coal lessers, which take out the remaining oil. And we also have a, uh, a charcoal vessel also uh, for taking out uh, what we call a light uh, vapor. So these are the two pieces uh, together, and it's just lists, of course, of why we chose what we did, and basically was to drive down uh, the cost of the uh, civil portion of, uh, of installing this equipment. Here you can see the size of a person that's compared to us, so you understand it's a fairly large refrigerator. Here's under construction. Uh, these are heat exchangers in the upper coal box. Uh, this shows the platform on the lower coal box already been fabricated. And I'll show you a picture here coming up of this hot hat where all the valves and turbines are mounted and uh, go through the vacuum vessel uh, to the internal piping of this, uh, of this coal box. Again, these heat exchangers belong to this, and so you get an idea about what size of what we're talking about. Here's a picture before it's painted, right, of this section of the top of the lower coal box of course, the stand that it actually uh, surrounds this box. Now, when they go to manufacture, this will be lifted up and, and actually held in place here, and then all the piping will be assembled underneath it. So this serves both as a final installation, but also a jig, right, to finish the, uh, the piping as it's being put together. Here's just a picture of uh, our 1999 uh, coal compressor coal box that we and built here from scratch at uh, Jefferson Lab. So uh, if we're looking then about, this is the oil removal vessels we're looking at, here's the outdoor fill box, that's the uh, 360 caliber, and then here's the, the wall of the, of the existing building, and inside you can see the location of that lower fill box. All D, the other uh, location there, the other experimental hall also has a refrigerator, and this is generally what the facility looks like. It's got the hall where experiment is, the counting house for looking at these, uh, gathering the results of those experiments. And we have a small cryogenic building here. We've got a filling uh, gas tank, and we also have a liquid nitrogen and a helium doors, which hold liquid of helium and nitrogen outside the building. And then, of course, the refrigerators in the small building. Uh, if you take a look at that, uh, remember that, uh, well, I should say that we're utilizing an existing refrigerator we had on site. It was built in 1980. We had a 200-watt and 4 power refrigeration capability. Uh, another mode is if you use it as a pure liquefier, and it was only capable of about 2 grams per second. The actual load for Paul D is really a mix of it, somewhere in between the two of this, and uh, it's 0.7 grams per second liquefaction plus 100 watts. This is what it looks like. This is a refrigerator, a lot smaller than the central heat liquefier. And this is one of the, uh, the compressors, uh, which is a self-contained hermetic uh, screw compressor on a small scale, capable of about 18 grams per second. So the other uh, Hall D refrigeration equipment that we needed uh, for this, this is stuff that we had to buy in order to fulfill it, but we already had the refrigerator and we had most of the compressors. In truth, we really need three compressors. We've got two of the two of the three that we need. This is the building under construction that we looked on the site plan. Uh, it's come a long way since this time, but this gives you an idea that this is a much smaller facility than our central liquid uh, This shows just liquid nitrogen door. That's uh, one of the doors that that was uh, being delivered uh, to the site. This is a picture of the gas tank, uh, which brings helium gas in the system to be uh, liquefied. And uh, a little bit about our cryogenic uh, schedule so far. Here you can see each one of the CD2s and 3s and so forth. Where we are right now is right down here. That is, we've got major equipment being delivered and installed. Uh, that's not the 4K coal box. That's not the Compressors yet, but basically it is we're installing the piping. We've got a lot of the subsystem instrument air systems in and so forth. And so that's uh, going, and, and we just need to complete this with the 
actually think it's equivalent. And then this shows basically when uh, we'll be doing our uh, all D uh, refrigerator installation, commissioning, and so forth. So the project is moving uh, along very nicely in the CD3 uh, project. So uh, this just reiterates a little bit of what I just spoke about, about what our, our status is. But the bottom line is that we're on schedule and we're on budget uh, for cryogenics. And so I'll be more than happy then to answer any questions that you might have in this time. You must be really thorough, did you? <laughs>
across a cycle to take care of this problem. Although what the Ghani cycle does is it basically makes these pressure ratios constant. So the second stage here, right, remains a constant three and a half. The first stage we take and we basically uh, allow it, suction of the first stage, to float. And it varies from one to 7.5. And when we change from a very low refrigeration load to a high refrigeration load, it's the pressure in these three that are changed to maintain a constant pressure ratio. We took that 200 grams a second, and we come back separate in a separate compressor, okay, and say, okay, it's taking up one atmosphere, for instance, and injecting into this interstage, and perhaps this is not as efficient as it could be, but it's a small flow, therefore it's a small compressor. So where was the gain? The gain was in the second stage for sure, because this is where the majority of the flow is being bypassed, and we separated out this return flow. So you say, why do we have three stages? Well, this is a very simplification about how it works, but basically it takes a look and goes back to the basic performance of the devices that you're using that we used to just say, well, oh, it doesn't matter because it's, those compressors aren't very big. Things have changed with the two calibre type systems. See it? So uh, I have kind of an answer to the question about the CEUs. Bruce was kind of like me. I'm not sure. So I believe, and I you who are PEs here, what you have to do is present your documentation to the board to get your CEU credits. What you ought to do probably in that presentation of what you took, note that you had to make up one session Video. Now, Bruce, in my opinion, is they may not give it to you. The reason is because the documentation requirements and such for non-face-to-face, -face, it's called instruction, is quite a bit more strenuous than this form or this face-to-face -face contact. So I would worry a little bit about it. But you can try it. I think they, they leave a lot of it up to you. You'll have to see what happens. They were also quite friendly when I, I called them about this one. They, they were very willing to talk to you about it. Say, here's, here's what we can pass, but not pass. So you could also play the card as you do that with the number of contact hours, but they actually were scheduled. You can see we put the CPUs lower than the number of actual contact hours. You may be able to play that one too. So anyway, good luck. Let me know what you find out. If you guys, if somebody tries it, let me know what you find out. Um, Okay, a couple other things. Make sure you fill out your survey forms. 
The other thing is I'd love to have all speakers of this series come up here, please. You're all decked out. Come on out here. <laughs> trying to figure out who these guys were. I don't see them dressed up like this all the time. <laughs> so we just wanted to thank you guys and give you a little token of our appreciation. So by the time you have it. So, you know, when you're in an engineering division, you have all kinds of gadgets and things that you can make up. We turn to, tend to turn trash into fun, fun gadgets. So <laughs> we did. And so Tanya, why don't you pass it on out? What we did is there's a Thanks to 12 Jim, we have some stub ends of uh, the, the vacuum chambers that go into the dipoles that were all left over. We had to throw them out we recycle them. <laughs> Along with, you'll notice some conflat flanges, I think, which were also trashed. <laughs> the, the pins and pencil sets, those, those are brand new. <laughs> it's, uh, we had them engraved, I think it was just basically their names and appreciation for uh, contributing to this, this seminar series. So anyway, let's give them a hand. Okay, and the last thing, um, again, I'll make my pitch for uh, other seminar subjects, particularly if you'll volunteer to present, that'd be great. Um, I'd say that we will try and drum up one or two for the summertime. Uh, we want to try and keep the momentum going. Uh, we'll try and announce it the same way we did this last time. I won't tell you that we'll have CEUs associated with it. We may do that a try on the, um, the uh, superconducting magnet series. If we can get people together. George to help us out with that too. <laughs> so anyway, keep an eye on the, the emails. We'll try and get that stuff out. I think that's it. So thanks for coming. Appreciate your involvement.